Scott Kesterson shoots raw and gritty stuff. Franco! Canadian soldiers at war, ambushes, raids, confrontations. This is everyday life for soldiers and the Afghan people. Take care, man. Scott is a former National Guardsman from Oregon who'd always dreamed of being a war photographer. Now, with no formal training and no major media outlet behind him, he managed to get himself embedded in Afghanistan, and he set himself up as a citizen journalist, risking his life on the front lines with his camera in hand. Oh. Now, Scott built a following on the web, uh, blogging from the battlefield for sites like the Huffington Post and posting clips on sites like YouTube, sometimes scoring more than a million hits for clips like this. Hey. Hey. I can't believe that guy's not dead. Kesterson's work has come together in an upcoming documentary called At War. Hello. How do you feel? People shooting each other, stabbing each other, little kids with crazy injuries. What does that mean? That film was called At War and the man who made it. Scott Kesterson. Good to see you. Welcome to the show. Real pleasure, man. So, uh, dude, like reading your story, man, is interesting because it's not like you're that guy who said, I'm going to be a journalist when I was 12 years old. You're 40 years old, you have a job, and then you're like, I got to pick another career. <laughs> yeah. War yes. reporter. Uh, yeah, kind of like changing careers on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> so, Were yeah. you on? Do you have to get tested for steroids in that business? Actually, no, but you know, it's but. <laughs> yeah, good. Exactly. So, so, what drew you to covering the war? Uh, I'm sorry. What say? drew you to covering the war? Well, you know, it's kind of one of these things. I grew up on the images of Vietnam, and I was moved not by the war, <clears throat> but by the, by what was being done. I mean, you figure these guys are there, taking that. Now, my life took a whole different spin. You know, I, I got introduced to photojournalism by a, by a photojournalist in, in my hometown, Roseburg, Oregon, when I was 14, but got married at 21, adopted two boys, raised them, spent my time homeschooling them, mm -hmm. and got, thir got to 35, started a small contracting business in Portland, Oregon, specialty contractor doing outdoor garden structures, outdoor living spaces, hit 40, had the massive midlife crisis. You know, it's like, what am I doing? Could have bought a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> there's two, there's a lime green Lamborghini in Portland. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, you know, and it's just like you kind of have to sit back and go, what are you doing? And one of the things that just kept hitting on me is what, what it was the love that I've had all through my life. Even the guy, one of the guys who worked at me, he goes, you don't build stuff to, to build it, you build it to photograph it. And that's kind of the truth. I mean, I, so I started just making the moves to go back to figure a way to get into, into photography. Mm -hmm. uh, was on MySpace, found a site called PhotoMuse. It was run by this guy. I had no idea who he was other than his name was David Leeson. Blew my mind. This guy had done everything that I dreamed of doing. Combat photographer, he'd been in multiple wars, won the Pulitzer in 2003 for the invasion of Iraq II. His images weren't, his images were what I would say makes, it was the thing of bringing emotions out of war in the way that we need to feel war. His images, uh, is, they're raw. Yes. There's a rawness to them that, you, that a lot of times some of the war photography, even over the past, comes back very cinematic and glorious. Yes. And I find that that kind of misrepresents what's actually happening. Well, I think what David's images, what drew me so much is they were personal. They, they brought you into the, into the moments in these most sensitive and emotional ways to make the human connection to the drama of war. Mm -hmm. Even in the most horrid moments, you could find that human connection to where we re could relate to it all. Well, how did they let you in to hang out with the soldiers then? Like, how do you get to that point? Well, it was just kind of a weird process because, I mean, David and I linked it literally on MySpace. We're, we're emailing back and forth over a process of a couple of days. He says, what do you want to do? And I said, look, what I want to do is what you've done, but I'm too old. He goes, no, you're not. I'll mentor if you want to do this. And I jumped. I mean, I literally within, it was like 15 seconds later, I'm like, yes. 24 hours later, I'm like, closing my business down, going to do this thing. And I, I was like, if I have to work at Starbucks, I'll work at Starbucks. This is a dream. You I know? ask you a question. Is that out of character for you? Are you the kind of guy that can jump that quickly? Yes, yeah? I am. I am. I am that type of person that if I feel, if I can feel it in my gut, I'll go for it. Because there's nothing, you can't live life by sitting waiting behind. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got, you've got, we have one run here, and that one run is to take advantage of those things that we truly believe in, and that was one of my callings. One of my, you know, I'm just one of those things that I found is really, everything in my life made sense the minute I did that. And it's like you've been waiting your whole life. It doesn't matter when. It just is the fact you do it. All right, you know, stick around. We come back, we're going to talk more with uh, Scott. I want to find out what it's like, if there's a difference between the American soldiers and the Canadian oh, soldiers sure. that are there. More with Scott Kesterman after the break. <laughs> and I'm sitting there getting a cup of coffee, and I look up, and here comes a Canadian tank, and it parks up in the parking lot across the street. 
And I'm like, okay, this, this is this is beyond real. And the guy gets out, and he goes up, and he gets four double doubles, and he gets a bag of, of, of tin donuts, and he goes back in the tank. And right Please come back tomorrow. One of my favorite journalists in the history of the world is Joe Schlesinger, and he will be on the show tomorrow. And then, how about this? Paul Rudd and Jason Segel from I Love You, Man. We'll be on the show tomorrow. Amongst a bunch of other films that they've been in. Joe, Joe Schlesinger has been, has been in numerous war zones and, and, and gotten to know soldiers over different areas. I know you spent time in Afghanistan. <sighs> You hung with American soldiers and Canadian soldiers, yes. right? Is there a difference between the two? I think there is. I mean, Canadians, I would say there's one thing about the Canadian soldiers definitely is I feel that they, they are a little more reserved because they, they feel like they're always under scrutiny and under attack for being considered peacekeepers and not war fighters. And that's an ongoing struggle that I think even today there's some identity issues there. So the soldiers feel that? It, it, there's a lot of, there, the media is a, in journalists embedded, whatever, you're, you're a little more standoffish. But, you know, once you break that barrier, <laughs> <laughs> They're the, some of the greatest guys I've been around. Yeah. You know, I think what the thing that strikes me too is how the presence of mind is in the worst situations. I mean, one of those clips you showed there, and it, it's, um, and actually it was on your lead-in when you said, you know, I want to, I want to get into what the, what it's like in their minds. He's throwing a grenade, but just before that, when I mean, you have this standing joke that the one thing they would do over there is instead of war fighting, they'd be building wells and going to shiras, which are community meetings. And I mean, we're we're getting hammered at that moment in time. There's, there's real life stuff. Oh yeah, on. you've got. RPG rockets going overhead, there's rounds going overhead, and, and Dave, one of the guys in there, has the presence of mind just as he yells out and he goes, we're here to give you a well. We're here to give you a well. <laughs> and I mean, and it's like right after that, all hell breaks loose on their side again. It's yeah. just like this, it's, it's a strange humor rally call. There's a very dry sense of humor, I thought. Oh, it, it's horrendous. Yeah, it really is. You know, you guys all have Tim Hortons over at Kandahar, which made a big scandal for Canada National because the government sponsor backed, the, it, it, let me tell you, it's the greatest thing going. It's like an R&R &R <laughs> thing. Yeah. And you just got to put yourself in the mindset that you're in this absolute bizarro world over there anyway. And it's just out of, out of any context we have here. And you go to Kandahar and there's a Tim Hortons. I mean, got to work and get a donut and get a coffee and get a double-double, you know? I mean, it's like, <laughs> what is that? So I'm, I, I go over one morning and I'm, I'm sitting there and I, one of the morning, when I go to Kandahar, I often and would not take my, I wouldn't shoot much because yeah. I've just, it's relaxed. And I'm sitting there getting a cup of coffee and I look up and here comes a Canadian tank and it parks up in the parking lot across the street. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, th this, is, this is beyond real. And the guy gets out and he goes up and he gets four double doubles and he gets a bag of, of, of tin donuts and he goes back in the tank and drives away. Well. You know, but I guess, you know, I, people, I guess that brings so much a sense of home to them there, which you can't possibly have in that environment. What you do is, it's a very, like, talk about the raw photos, it's a very <laughs> soldier's eye view of the war. Did you, did you, like, what's that like talking to the soldiers and getting us, how do they view what's going on there on both sides? You know, I think that in the, in the movie that it comes out, I asked the guy right at the very beginning, his name's George Leverton, he's a really good friend, I said, so what, what do you think of this context that all soldier, soldiers are right wing, and right wing supporters of Bush? And I think his comment just hit it. He goes, you know, that's so far from the truth. We're soldiers, we all have, but we have a job to do, and that's what we do. And I think that's really where you start with this whole thing, is that these guys are, they're like all of us. They've made a decision to, to run a, a career path, if you want to do that, that's pretty much on the edge when it gets to war. Otherwise, it's, it's not so different on a day-to-day day -to -day than what we do. Mm -hmm. When it gets to war, though, there is a... Um, Politics pretty much go out the window when you get down there. And that's what I think is really amazing because they become deeply human and you dig into that rich dimension of who we all are. That's what war does. What's the strain on your mind, man? Because I know that you can be adventurous and a lot of people want adventurous jobs, but soldiers come back with post-traumatic stress and it's a very real situation for people. But you go there, like, do you get the sense over time that this is building inside your mind? You're experiencing something that's wholly traumatic. Well, I think, you know, different people handle things different ways. There's a, a book called On Killing, and I, he talks about when your cup gets full, you just don't know when that's going to happen. That's the gauntlet we all run. You know, I'm committed to doing this work for a long time, but I don't know what that time's going to come. There may be some day that it just flips and I can't do it anymore, and I accept that. While it's here, I, I push out there to do, continue to do this sort of work and coverage that I'm doing. But um, there isn't the way you deal with it when you come home is often just unexpected. You know, that's yeah. I can imagine it would just sort of catch you by surprise. Yeah, and it did actually on the national piece, and we talked about this yeah. a little bit ago. Um, they they were filming um, in Dallas where David and I were editing, and they I looked at the sequence which we titled the death sequence, and it was 
t showing the ceremonies of death from three different countries, Americans, Canadians, and Afghans. And I had not seen this edited p section. And it, it was like a year after I'd been gone or been back, and it just, it hit me. I mean, just like a hole inside of me opened up and I'm in tears and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling all of that. I mean, I, that one summer in Kandahar, there was 45, 48 ramp ceremonies for, for soldiers. You know, this isn't, you get, it's almost like you get into a pattern with it, mm -hmm. but the real is war has a human cost. And that human cost is we're losing people and they're coming home in, in caskets, you know, and that's. Oh, as you, your opinion of the war changed right, when you went over there, how did it change? Is it, a, in your, from your perspective, being with them, is it a winnable war? Like, wh how do you look at that? I don't think Afghanistan, in the context of traditional wars, so it's a winnable war. I think that when we look at it from a standpoint of what it started out to be, it was a counterinsurgency war, they were using a lot of special operations forces, the idea was to go after Al-Qaeda, stand up a, an internal army that could fight, and then we would leave. That was the model. And that's where I think it needs to be. This massive surge we're doing right now, I'm, I have a, a lot of questions. Of what, I mean, that's, I'm going to document it, but what, will it, with my own personal line of opinion, will it succeed? I don't know. I think that's throwing a, a lot of uh, the wrong, uh, wrong way. When you, uh, when you go there, as a citizen journalist, how are you perceived by the other media or by the soldiers? The soldiers and I get on, fantastic. I mean, that's, they've seen my work. And the more that I've done this, the more they've read. You know, At War is a project developed. I, I wrote 120 articles. I wrote, I did 25, 24 video stories. Um, I did two, it was concluded in two pieces on Frontline, two TV station pieces here for CBC as well. And then I won the Emmy in 2007. So, I mean, it was, a, and then put up for the Peabody in 2008. It was a massive project. Sure. And when you have that volume of work and people get a chance to really see what you're about, you're not a mystery when you go in. Believe me, if anybody researches who people are, yeah. it's soldiers. Let me tell you, they will dig it out. When, when do you go back? I go back in two weeks. I'll be back for about three to four months. I'm going to be there for this new surge. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on some new work on the original battle of Operation Anaconda, which happened in March of 2002. The film's called At War. Keep an eye out for it when it, when it comes out. Uh, Scott's actually trying to get into theaters right now, I believe, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, and the website is, uh, is um, atwarfilm.com. Scott Kesterson, everyone. Thank you very much. And we'll come back, investigative reporter Jerry B. All right, we've already tackled the crisis in the car industry. You can smash that car into a wall yes. and live. Yes, uh, the test was done. Okay, go do it. So how is Jerry D going to handle the global economic meltdown? Tonight, he goes to the Financial Center of Canada to get the inside story. Right now, the infamous ticker. Look at some of the stocks there. T-E-M-P is, oh no, that's... That's the temperature.